Hi and welcome back again to Connect. I trust that you've had a blessed week and that you're safe and sound in your homes. To all our essential workers, we want to say another big, big thank you. We really appreciate all your hard work and dedication. Now last week we had an awesome service. But just wait, this week it's going to be even better. It's a personal favorite of mine. We're going to have Ruth teaching and the title of her message is, You Have Received Power. So I'm super excited to hear what she's going to share with us. But just remember to like this message and you can leave a comment in the comment section below. And you can also share the stream with all your friends and family. So without further delay, let's have some church. caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave For blessings, Jesus, Jesus, you don't owe me anything, and more than anything that you can do, I just want you. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I've sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you, oh Jesus. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want For blessings And Jesus, you don't owe me anything But more than anything that you can do I just want you And I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do just want you and nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I 
just want you and nothing else and nothing else Jesus nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I'm caught up in your presence Jesus I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave And I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me just want you I just want you God just want you God I just want you and nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want your hope, your glory, your joy. Your protection, I want you, God, you, God, you, Lord. I just want your hope, your glory, your joy, your protection. I want you, God, I want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Oh, oh, oh. 
to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you oh to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you everyone and welcome once again to another session of connect christian church online i trust that we will be blessed 
going through the word together, just as we have over the last few weeks. The title of my message this morning is You Have Received Power. In the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, we are told of how Jesus, after he had resurrected from the grave, kept appearing to his disciples on different occasions just to show them that he truly was alive. On one such occasion, Jesus said to them, do not leave Jerusalem until you have received the gift of God that I spoke to you about before. In verse eight of Acts chapter one, we then find out that that gift of God was the power of God given to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. Last week, Pastor Nkholisi taught us about the power that it took to raise Jesus from the grave. How magnificent, how incredible, how earth shattering that power was. It was a vast power that none of us could have ever imagined. But the book of Ephesians chapter one verse 19 then tells us that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside all of us. See, Apostle Paul in Ephesians was trying to express to us how important it is to understand the power of God, to understand the magnitude of the power and the authority that has been given to each of us as believers. Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, said we would do greater works than what he did. And we all know what great work Jesus did. But it would be impossible for any of us to achieve even just what Jesus achieved without the power of God. We could never do it. So it is important for us to understand and grasp and receive the power of God that wants to work in us because it is already lying on the inside of us. We've just celebrated Easter weekend and Easter is really a reminder and a commemoration of the power of God. There was no greater demonstration of God's power than what it took to raise Jesus from the dead. And because we're just coming out of Easter weekend, it's important for us to ensure that what we've just commemorated and what we commemorate on an annual basis every Easter is not in vain. Let's not let the power of God be in vain. So the intention with my message this morning is that each of us regain that understanding of the power that's at work within us and that we're propelled into action by it. Amen. So power can take many forms. Power can be seen as a force. The force where you lose control. The force that you experience when you experience a miracle. When you say, I don't know what happened, but something took over. That's the force that is a power. That's just one form of power. Power can be inherent. It can be the power that lies within a thing just because of its nature. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if an elephant is running, charging at you, you need to make a plan and maybe run the other way. Because there is inherent power in an elephant that is greater than the power that is inherent in your little body, physically. That's inherent power, another form of power. Power can be moral power. The moral power that enables you to overcome temptation to do wrong. Moral power that, that takes over when a situation comes towards you, asking and compelling you to do the wrong thing, and you are enabled to do the right thing. That is moral power at work on the inside of you. It can be the power and influence of riches or wealth. Some people have power just because of who they are, just because of the wealth that they possess or the resources that they have in the natural. That is some form of power. Power can also be found in numbers, in strength of numbers as we call it. So like the power that the army has going out in big numbers, targeting an enemy, that is power in numbers. But having understood and been taught about the power of God last week, we now know that the power of God is all of that and more. The power of God is greater than any other form of power. There is nothing like the power of God. So we need to yield to Paul's prayer and understand the power that is at work within us in order for us to accomplish what God intends for us to accomplish. There is an account in the Bible of a young man who lived in a time before this declaration was made by Paul to say that the power of God is at work within us. 
in that time, the power of God was available for those that, that were anointed to carry the power of God, that were anointed to operate in the power of God, and he was one such young man. This young man's name is Daniel. And if we read in the book of Daniel chapter 2, there is an account of where Daniel, as one of the wise men that had been hired by the king, ended up in a situation that he didn't walk into voluntarily, much like some of the challenges that we find ourselves in in this day. So King Nebuchadnezzar, who was king in that time, had a very bad dream in Daniel chapter 2. This dream was so horrible that when he woke up, he was shaken. He was disturbed. He was so shaken, King Nebuchadnezzar, that he decided to call all of his wise men. He had access to astrologers. He had access to magicians. He had access to, to wise, wise people of that time. And he called them all in the morning, excluding Daniel and his friends. He called the top, the top brass of his experts. And he said to them, Guys, I had a dream, and I'm shaken. So what I need you to do is tell me what the dream was, and then tell me what it means. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 10, one of the experts replied as follows. There is not a man on earth who can tell the king this matter, and no one has ever asked such a thing. No one except the gods can reveal it, and their dwelling is not in mortal flesh. This angered the king so much that he put out a decree to say all the wise men were to be killed. Not just the fool standing in front of him that couldn't explain the dream to him, but every person that was called a wise man in that time. And that included Daniel and his friends. So the king's captain and the king's guard all went out to look for all the wise men that they could bring them back and kill them as the king had commanded. But the response of Daniel was a remarkable one in this situation. When they got to Daniel, he said to the king's captain, what's with all the drama, bruh? Basically, he was saying to him, why is this decree so harsh? Why is it so urgent? And the king's captain went on to explain to him everything that had happened that morning and how they had come to this point. With confidence, Daniel, knowing the power of God that was available for him, asked to see the king. He hadn't seen such a thing before, but he had seen his God before, and he knew that this had to end differently. So he appeared before the king and he asked the king for some time. And of course, the king did grant him some time that he may go and do what he needed to do and come back with the dream and the answer. He went to his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, to seek compassion from the Lord, that they wouldn't be executed. The secret was then revealed to him during the course of that night, and he blessed the Lord. And before he went to tell the king what the secret was that the Lord had revealed to him, he was so confident that he even stopped on the way and told the king's captain to stop killing the people, to make sure that he didn't kill anyone, because he knew that the Lord had spoken to him. There are many lessons from this piece of scripture that we can take away from Daniel. That when you understand the power of God, when you understand that God is available for you, you respond differently, even in situations that you have never encountered before. Number one of Daniel's responses that we can learn is no fear. Daniel could have been shaking like a leaf when they came to fetch him, telling him that he's going to be executed. But he chose to do otherwise. He boldly faced not just the king's captain, but the king himself concerning this decree, knowing that there was a higher authority, an authority higher than that which was challenging him, higher than that which was threatening his life, higher than anything else that can ever exist. He knew that he serves God, the God of all power, and that meant that he should approach every situation with no fear. Number two of his responses was no complaining. Daniel had the opportunity to say, but I wasn't even there. I wasn't there this morning. I was not good enough a wise man to consult when the king was in distress. But now I'm suddenly a good wise man. Now that he's looking for wise men to kill, 
He could have been complaining. If it was in our day, Daniel would have probably set up a hashtag justice for Daniel campaign where people would be commenting and tweeting and saying, well, he doesn't deserve it. Save the Hebrew boys. They were not a part of it. They've done nothing. But instead of complaining, he responded differently. So the lesson to us is to not complain. Let's not complain of the situations that we find ourselves in. But let us rather seek God and find out what we need to do in the situation. Number three was boldness and confidence. Daniel went before the king and asked for some time. Not because he had seen this happen before. Not because he had been told by somebody that this is what God does. But because he knew God, he had boldness and he had confidence. He made a commitment to the king based on his knowledge of God and nothing else. It was a faith-based commitment. Nothing tangible, nothing in the natural, just his faith and belief in God is what gave him boldness and confidence. Lesson number four from Daniel was right counsel. Daniel could have sat with the other wise men and complained and strategized and tried to find out what happened in order for them to end up where they are. He would have sat there and tried to find out what actually happens when the king is about to kill somebody? Does he kill people slowly and painfully? Does he torture them? Or does he kill them quickly and painlessly? He could have gone to so many different forums. But instead, Daniel sought the right counsel. Daniel knew that he needed to sit with like-minded people. People who knew and understood the power of God. People who knew and understood that when you're faced with a challenge like no other before, the only place that you can go is to the Most High. He went to his friends, to Mishael, to Hananiah, to Azariah, saying to them, guys, let us go before the Lord. Because he knew that they too would also go before the Lord. And collectively, they would be able to get over this mountain. They would be able to conquer this giant. They would be able to get victory, ultimately, by seeking the right counsel. Number five of the lessons from Daniel was to seek the Lord. The same way that he went to find friends that believed in seeking the Lord, he actually then intentionally went to seek the Lord in his own private space. That's the lesson to us, is that when you are faced with a situation and a challenge that, that is unfamiliar, that you've never seen before, that you go and seek the face of the Lord for yourself, not to go to any other person and hope they have a word for you, but to seek the Lord in your own space, understanding that God is for you, he is with you, he is within you, and he's available to speak to you. So we should seek the Lord. Number six of the lessons from Daniel is praise and thanksgiving. See, when the secret was revealed to him, it was in the middle of the night. He could have questioned it and doubted it. And in all likelihood, he maybe did. But instead of spending time questioning and doubting, he spent time praising God, thanking him and blessing him. His prayer of thanksgiving, blessing the Lord, is recorded in the book of Daniel, where he thanks God for revealing secrets. He thanks him for being the one who is there for him when things are not looking the way they should. We also ought to spend our time thanking God and praising him for the moments of clarity and the moments where it's not so clear, for the moments where we're feeling strong and the moments where we're not feeling so strong. In whatever situation we find ourselves, we need to be praising God and we need to be giving thanks. In all of the above, not only did Daniel remind himself of the power of God through his response, but he ignited something on the inside of him. He ignited something that would drive him into action. He ignited something that would propel him to the place that he needed to be in order for God's power to be shown. So he then went in absolute confidence, Daniel. And he went on his way to tell the king what had happened, what he dreamt, and the interpretation. He stopped by the king's captain to stop this decree. What kind of confidence is that? Where you go and override the highest power in the land and you say, you can stop killing people now. There's no need to kill anyone. Don't kill anybody. 
I have the answer. This is before he had even appeared to the king and gotten the go-ahead from the king or the confirmation that the so-called secret that he thought was revealed to him is indeed the secret that the king was looking for. He had absolute confidence in God that it was done and he made sure while he was still on the way to the king that he made sure that he saved not only his own life but everybody else's. That is evidence of the power of God in action. That is what happens when you're working and operating in the power of God. Lives have got to be saved. When he appeared before the king, Daniel said, in verse 28, we are told that what you asked, O king, is impossible, but there is a God in heaven. We need to behave as though we know that there is a God in heaven. Family, I want to tell you this morning that the whole world is looking to us. The whole world is looking to the church because we, we have said, we have decreed that we are the children of God. We are the children of the Most High. They may not know who the Most High is or what he's capable of doing, but trust me, they know what we are expected to be doing in this time. So when we behave as they are behaving, we confuse those around us that we are supposed to be inspiring. Let us seek the Lord and be empowered to move in the action of what he would have us do. Some of the experts in that day were experienced scientists. They weren't just experts by name. They were experienced scientists. Just as in our day we are faced with impossible challenges such as COVID-19 that require experienced scientists. But in that day they too said this was an impossible challenge. They faced an impossible challenge, something they had never heard of before, something they had never seen before, and they couldn't do it with the scientific knowledge that they had. Instead, it took one who knew the Lord to help them. So those who know the Lord, when humanity is faced with situations that are beyond their knowledge, those who know the Lord have to stand up and seek the Lord in order to get solutions to impossible situations. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, but understand this, that in the last days dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come, difficult days that will be hard to bear. It goes on to describe how people will be in that day. It says that they will be holding a form of godliness, religion, although they have denied its power, for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. The Bible says avoid these people and keep far away from them. You know, the issue of a form of godliness, denying power, is something that in my mind looks, it looks very simple. I'll share a very simple example with you. So you can put German branded mags on a vehicle, on your 15 seater Japanese minibus, for example. But although you've put your German branded mags on it, it will still only have the power of that Japanese bus on it. You haven't changed the engine. You haven't changed the power at work within it. So it cannot have any more power than what it inherently has in it. That is a form of, a form of power. You can also have a very powerful engine. Picture your, your six liter, very, very, very powerful engine. And you can take that thing, push it to the top of a hill every morning and let it roll down because you want to help it along in motion the way you always have. But this thing has power in it. It has power that is lying dormant within it. But you choose to push it slowly to a hill every morning that it can just roll down the hill and at least move a little bit. I want to say the two are both forms of godliness. So whether you say with your tongue that you're a Christian, but on the inside you haven't really changed anything, it's a form of godliness with no power. Or if you declare that you are a Christian, you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit and it is at work within you. You are like that vehicle that has power within it. But if you will only just push yourself out of the door every day and just roll down the hill the same way that everybody is, you are like that powerful vehicle that just rolls down a hill every morning. 
You need to ignite that engine. You need to put that power to work. You need to ignite and rev that car up that it can move in the full power that is within it, the power that is inherent within it. It's a simple example, but I'm saying can we stop, stop carrying so much power and just moving the same way that the whole world is moving along. Just tug along the same way, struggling along the same way as though we had no power within us. It's disappointing, I know, when, when something appears to be one thing and then becomes another. My husband has this little trick, gimmick joke thing that he does, which I initially didn't get because I didn't grow up here, but I believe all South Africans know about it, where it's a, it's a made you look kind of trick, where you expect to see something and then it's not what it is. So somebody then just does that in your face. So I made you look and you were expecting to see something and then boop, it's not actually that. So many of us say we're a Christian. Yes, we profess that we are a Christian. And when people are faced with challenges, they come to us expecting that as a Christian, there is a response of power that is gonna come from within me. And they look at me and they basically just see a boop, made you look, it's not what you were expecting. So let us not be form believers that carry a form of godliness, but denying its power. Because the last people that had a form of godliness, that were the most religious, denying its power, that I know about, that are recorded in scripture, were the Pharisees. See, they had a form of godliness. They were the most religious people of that day. But when they saw the demonstration of God's power in Jesus, they were offended. So offended that they took him to the cross. We shouldn't be those kinds of believers. We should not be form believers. We should be power believers. Power believers that show a demonstration of power. Power believers that show that when you carry the power of God within you, things around you will change. See, we, are, we have access to a round table of experts. We have access because the book of Ephesians, like I said in chapter 1, said that we carry the Holy Spirit power that conquered the grave within us. And Jesus, in the book of John chapter 17, said that he dwells within us, and God the Father dwells in him. So we are carrying the Trinity within us. And I want to say that every time you find yourself in the place of prayer, you are sitting at a boardroom with three of the most powerful people that could ever, ever touch this earth. You are sitting at a round table of four with you and the Trinity. There is no powerful, powerful force beyond that. So make declarations, make decrees, change situations, speak life, speak solutions, speak answers, and this whole world, this whole world can experience the power of God through us. So be encouraged, believers. Move in power. Put that power of God that is in you at work, that the world can experience a touch from the Most High God. Be blessed this morning, be encouraged, and do what would make our Father proud. Amen. Good morning, family. I trust that you were blessed by that message, and I hope it encourages you in this season. In these times of uncertainty, it is not surprising that you may find yourself feeling fearful or anxious or just concerned that you're unable to guarantee your own safety and that of your loved ones. But I have good news for you. We serve a good God, a loving Father, who had a plan to ensure that we will be saved long before this crisis even arrived. We are blessed with remarkable world leaders who are leading this battle from the front to ensure that we save as many lives as possible. May God bless them. But with that said, the book of Acts in chapter 4 verse 12 said there is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved. That name is the name of Jesus Christ. I'm sure we can all agree that in these times our money cannot save us, our worldly knowledge cannot save us, the love of our family is unable to save us. So we need something greater, something more powerful, something more certain and that is found in the name of Jesus. If you have never prayed a prayer to welcome our Lord Jesus Christ as Lord over your life and Saviour, I'd like to encourage you to say that prayer with me this morning. Our Lord says, Come to me, 
all of you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If we pray that prayer this morning, you too can be a part of that promise. You too can be a part of God's family. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for sending your Son. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe in my heart that you took on my sin, you took on my sickness, you died on that cross, you were buried and you rose again that I may have life and have it in abundance. And so this morning I open up my heart and I invite you in to come and rule and reign and have your place. I surrender my will to yours and I say have your way. In Jesus name, Amen. If you have prayed that prayer with me, I'd like to welcome you to God's family. It's a family that is filled with promises. Part of those promises is that God says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. In the storm, you can be calm because he is with you and he is always in control. So take heart and be encouraged. Even those who have always been a part of this family, be encouraged this morning because God says when you go through the fire, it will not burn you. He is always there with you. Our God has not forgotten us. He is in control. In fact, we can be cheerful because he said, take heart and be of good cheer. In the world, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. So you too are an overcomer. Use this time wisely. Use it to be entrenched in the word. Use it to worship him more. Use it to have divine encounters with him, supernatural experiences in the comfort of your home. It's a good time for us to spend more time with him. If you're new to the family, we would like to send you some resources. So drop us an email on the details that are found on our website and we will get you started on this journey. Be encouraged, take heart and be blessed. Wow, now wasn't that just an awesome, awesome word? I'm truly blessed and I hope you were as well. I'm definitely going to have a blessed week. So now, if you have a prayer request or you'd like us to stand in prayer with you for anything, please contact us and our details are on your screen below. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and switch on the notifications so whenever we've got something to share with you, you'll get a reminder on your phone. So have a blessed week, stay safe, stay home, and remember, Jesus is still on the